Y'all spring breaking and twerking on Thursday and Friday, but you're ready to sit down on Sunday. Get your butt up. We got the praise of the Lord today, huh? <laughs> All right. We got to give it up for the heart of worship, huh? All right. So Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Watch what it says. It says, come to me, watch, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's praise the Lord in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in your house. We thank you for our children who are having their services as well. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to move in this place, to break the hardest heart, to mend the broken heart. We just ask you right now, Holy Spirit, just speak through me and just let me be able to say what you want. Don't let me dilute nor pollute your word, Father. Your word is ever present, Father God. Your presence is here and we feel it and we just thank you for what you've done, what you're doing and what you're going to do. So Holy Spirit, do your thing. And now as well, Father God, for those that continue to bless this ministry financially, you know who they are, our covenant partners, our online givers, our, 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 our members here, Father God, that continue to pour into this ministry financially. We bless them, their businesses, their homes. Never let them lack anything, Father God. Let them know that everything that they give, you always return full, for we can never outgive you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Would somebody say, Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, Get ready. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. read this verse in Matthew 11 and I do got to say uh, I heard y'all had a great service last week so that was awesome Pastor Nancy brought in commandments number 6 and number 5 we're down to 4 and 3 today next week we'll do 2 and 1 and we are done with the 10 and then we got a powerful series coming for you in April called Hope Alive it will bless you some of you need to invite somebody Somebody that needs hope, someone that is just broken, that you feel like, oh, if I invite them, they're not going to go. You're never going to know unless you invite them. You plant the seed and let God do the work, amen? So this verse says, and then you'll know why we're going into this verse in Matthew. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Now we see this verse and we know this verse because we've read it before. Uh, it, it's, it's asking us, it's telling us, come, you know, come, come to me. How many of you have experienced tiredness or burnout? I mean, I think all of us at some point, some of us will be afraid to admit it, but we deal with burnout. And then it goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I, I love that scripture and learn from me because God or Jesus in this, in this point, I'm going to show you an Old Testament and New Testament. God would never tell you, Jesus would never tell you to do something that he had not already done himself. God is the example. And so when God does it, he does it to show us how we should do it. And so when it says, take, your, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, it says, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and burden, and my burden is light. It's interesting because we live in a nation and we live in a generation, excuse me, that is suffering from the lack of peace. I mean, everybody wants world peace. We're not talking about war. When we talk about what's going on with East and we're talking about the Middle East war. And we just see this turmoil and we see this terrorism and all this ugly stuff. We come back to our nation, and I'm not even talking about just the evil that you see around at schools and at work, and, and the things that we see, the, the, the shootings and the deaths, and the evil that is out there. But we can just go personally into our lives and just say, Lord, we need peace ourselves. Would anybody agree with that? Some of us, we worship the Lord, but we really have no peace. And so I begin to wonder how true the relationship with God is, because if I really truly had a relationship with God, then I should know what peace is. Correct? And so some of us sometimes, I know, like I said, we have a hard time sleeping that night. Can't sleep. Keep tossing and turning because we're worried. And this one is telling me, come to me. Come to me. Commandment number four, when we see Exodus 20, verse 8. Watch what it says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, I'm going to read it all and then we'll go back to it. In verse 9, it says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Verse 10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son 
or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. Verse 11. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. It says, but then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it, made it. Interesting point here. Let me back up before we move forward. Commandment number four. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Hmm. When we first see that phrase, remember, there are two interpretations or translations that we can get from the word remember. I will go through the Hebrew translation of her and then I will go through the more layman term translation. When we talk about Hebrew, when, when the word says remember, it was talking about commemorate. So for example, how many of you men, throw you under the bus here, man. How many of you men remember your anniversary? All right, some of you ladies are like, yeah, right, you jerk. <laughs> you remember what the Cowboys did 7 and 9 in 2011, 2012, 2013, who was the quarterback, how many yards the rusher got and when he got hurt, but you can't remember your own birthday and your wife's anniversary. Let me preach. Oh, Pastor, you're going to do this really? We're doing so good, you know? <laughs> so he says to commemorate, to remember, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember, remember, remember. I must commemorate, I must celebrate the fact that we are here sitting in a church. We should be in a spirit of celebration. Now, I can get really technical and get really religious with you and tell you because there are some people that believe that church shouldn't be on Sunday for the Sabbath is a Saturday. We can get really religious about it right now if we want to. Or we can go to the New Testament and get to the point where Jesus was saying, hey, just save me one day. And so as today, we should come in like the Bible says in Psalms with thanksgiving in our heart to come in getting ready to worship and praise Him. Not come just because it's another Sunday, just because the Cowboys aren't playing, just because there's nothing else to do, just because the weather's too bad to be in the livestock show, just because I already ran out of money and I'm already done with spring break, but we should come every Sunday with our hands lifted high, getting ready to praise the one who gives us true rest in Jesus. All right, so what's the second interpretation? Number two. Remember. Why does he say remember? You know why? Because of what I just said. Because we forget. We forget. We don't forget our problems. But we do forget what God has brought us through. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. We should be walking into church and say, man, Lord, I was there. But look at where I'm at now. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm so better off than I was. And it's not because of this person or that person. But it's because of your presence, Lord. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. As you continue to read, you know, you got to understand that you read these Ten Commandments in the verse, in the books of Exodus, and you read it in the book of Deuteronomy. So you read it in Exodus, and you read it in Deuteronomy, and they sound almost alike, and you say, well, they are alike, because they're the same Ten Commandments. What you don't understand, and you don't understand timeline, is that in Exodus, they were being given to the Israelites as they're getting out of Egypt, as God saying, you better remember this, because look at what I did for you. When you travel 40 years later, that's in Deuteronomy, now God is saying, as a form of obedience and being my servant, I need you to remember these. He did it in Exodus, he does it in Deuteronomy. Why did he do the same thing again? Because we tend to forget. 40 years, 2,000 years have passed, and here we are in 2015, and some of us still don't know what the commandments are and don't live them. And so it's a, it's a reminder that, oh, that, that was Old Testament. No, it's the same. God still wants us to honor Him with those ten. Then it goes on to say, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is for the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And it tells you who, who not shooting work, so on and so forth. Then it goes on to say very particular in verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all in it. But then He rested on the same. And then you've heard me ask this question, does God really have to rest? Could God have done it everything in one day? Yes. Why does he do it in six? Why does he rest in the seventh? For the simple example of how we should live our lives. With planning, with purpose, with direction. 
There was a book that was written called The Overworked American, where the writer demonstrated how many uh, hours uh, employees worked then and now. And it was saying how stress is at an all-time high. For example, I'm going to read you a statistic of February 2000. Notice, we're 14 years, 15 years later. Back in the year 2000, the full-time employee worked an average of 163 more hours than the employees of 1969. 163 more hours the employees worked in 2000 than they did in 1969. How much do you think it's now? Where we're constantly seeing people having to get second, three, and third, and fourth jobs. Trying to figure out how can we make ends meet. I need to borrow here. I need to take that. Maybe I should gamble a little because if I gamble then I can get rich quick. Because I need money. We all need money. We understand that. Oh, wait till we get the commandment number one. It's going to be powerful. And what's interesting is that even when we're off on our off time, we're often engaging in activities that are more exhausting. We're often engaging in things that are just, do we need to do it? Do we have to do it? We really have lost the art of resting. We really have lost the art of take it easy. Just think about it. Just think about it. I'll give you an example. There's more TV channels to watch, more amusement parks to visit, more movies to rent. Thank you, Redflix, uh, Redbox and Netflix. More magazines to read, more online networks to explore, more pressure to spend your time usually, more uh, sites on Twitter, more uh, followers on Twitter, excuse me, more friends on Facebook, so on and so forth. And, and literally, you can go through this, and next thing you know, you've already spent an hour looking for something, and then you feel tired when you could have shut it off and taken a nap. Now some of you are looking at me saying, I knew it. I knew naps are good. I take them all the time. I'm going to talk about laziness in a minute. <laughs> oh yeah, real quick. <laughs> so don't worry about that. We'll get to you in just a minute. Have you ever gotten to the point, church, that you take a vacation and then you need a vacation for the vacation? What happened? What happened to going somewhere and relaxing? No, we gotta follow the agenda. Eight o'clock, we eat breakfast. Eight fifteen, we brush our teeth. Eight thirty, the bus is waiting for us to go to the to, to Disney Disneyland, and then we gotta go and let's catch MMR. And here we come back. Measles, mumps, and rebellion. You'll get that one later. Okay. <laughs> rest. We don't know how to rest. We're moving. We're moving. We're moving. What? Because this is the only time I got off. This is the only time I got off. And it seems like you're working faster than when you were working. We don't know how to stop. Take a deep breath. Enjoy the creation. We were in San Diego last week. I was doing a wedding in San Diego. And I, I honestly got to say, church, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm in the pulpit. I don't want the light to strike me. I said, Lord, speak to me. Tell me to open life in San Diego. And I will stay in San Diego, Lord. Just tell me. It was so beautiful. Seeing the wedding. You know, I should have put the picture, but I didn't bring it in. Seeing the way that I thought to myself, God, what, what are we doing here again? Oh, we're marrying somebody. Yeah, that's right. Lost track because of how beautiful it was. Rest. We need a vacation from the vacation. We go to the New Testament and even Jesus was tired at times. He was tired. He was so overwhelmed with ministry. And a lot of us, church, this is the problem. And I'm going to talk to the men here for a minute. Men. We act like the world revolves around us. Like if we don't get it done, it's not going to get done. I'll give you a saying that my friend said, if the President of the United States can be replaced, we can be replaced too. Don't give yourself too much credit, man. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. But watch what it says in Mark 6.31. Then because so many people were coming and going, watch what it says, going... They did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Have you ever been at work and you are so busy you skip lunch? Huh? Or nowadays, I mean, it's like you got a 30 minute lunch. 30 minutes? By the time I get in the car, go pick it up and come back, I already wasted 27 of it. So I have three minutes to eat down that water burger number two with double cheese and double whatever everything and Lord Jesus Christ with a Diet Coke hoping that I lose weight while I do it. And then I'm wondering why I have indigestion and ulcers. Or hemorrhoids for that reason, but we'll get to that sermon in another day. We're like this. There's not enough hours in a day. God, 
if you could only add an eighth day to the week, Lord. No. We don't enjoy our food. We don't enjoy our time. We don't enjoy where we're at. We're rushed. We feel like we're rushed. Jesus here is saying we didn't even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come by yourself. Key phrase, come by yourselves. Don't bring the clan because sometimes when you bring the clan, you can't rest. Come by yourselves. Decom decompress. Disconnect. Get some rest. And then it says to a quiet place. But if we go to the Old Testament, this is where I want to preach on this real quick. When we're talking about keeping the Sabbath and resting. Six days you should work and one you should rest. The Israelites understand, understand church where they're coming from. They are coming from a slave mentality. Somebody say slave. When you are a slave to something, you are bound to what it tells you to do. So therefore, you will do what it says, when it says, how it says, whenever it says. So when these Israelites were slaves under, under Egypt, they knew when they had to eat, if they were going to eat, when they had to wake up, and when they had to go to sleep. Now, you multiply this year in, year out, day in, day out, and you develop a pattern. You develop a pattern. And so a lot of times these Israelites were doing the same thing over and over and over. They didn't want to get whipped. They didn't want to get beaten. So you know what? I'll do as you say. Because you know what? As long as I'm getting something to eat, I know I got to work, but I got to eat. I got to work, and I got to eat. Doesn't that sound like today? If you don't work, you don't eat. Stay with me. Stay with me. And so they are programmed to follow their master's will, their master's rules, their master's commands. So now, God delivers them from Egypt through Moses. Watch. He delivers them from Egypt through Moses and they're headed out. And the first emotion is celebration. Watch. So they come out and they're like, oh my God, we are free. Are we really free? There are no longer no whips, there is no chains. There is no Pharaoh, there is no soldier getting after them and telling them what to do. They're simply roaming in the desert and they're walking out. But as they continue to walk, stay with me. As they continue to walk, do they really understand what freedom is? The answer is no. Pastor, how do you know that? Because every so often they would continue to complain to Moses. You should have left us where we were. Pastor, what does this have to do with rest? Oh, just stay with me. Pa 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 Moses, you took us out of Egypt where at least we had spam every Sunday morning, every Monday, every Tuesday. I don't care if they made us work nine days a week. As long as we have food. So who cares if they beat us? So who cares if we were bound? So who cares if we were not free? At least we had a job and we had food. And that's the mentality we have today, church. We are bound by work because if you don't eat you don't work that statement is semi true stay with me and so they're going along and Moses is saying what are you doing don't you realize what God your Savior has done he's delivered you from that so while they were free their mind was still bound God didn't take them out of Egypt into the desert to work he took them out of the desert to be free why could they see that? Why could they appreciate that? Because when you've done something for so long, you don't see it wrong. Oh God, church, let me preach. It's the analogy that I've done of trash. You walk into a house that has trash that hasn't been taken out and it reeks. But give yourself about 10 minutes and you don't smell it anymore. Because now you're used to the stench. And a lot of us are so used to the stench of having to work, 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 work. Because if I don't work, I won't be blessed. Where does it say that? The Bible is telling me he gave me six days. And he said, on the seventh day, I'm giving you a command. I'm not asking you how you feel about it. I'm telling you, you should rest because I have made it holy. And I am the blesser. And it is a blessed day. Watch So their slave mentality forced them to try to survive. Well, we don't got any food. We're used to people giving us food. Yes, because you were bound. God didn't send them in the desert to survive. He sent them in there to thrive. 
Stop looking at the hand that was feeding you. Start looking at the Savior who delivered you. You're not hearing what I'm saying, church. And I know you're still saying it doesn't make any sense with what you're saying. Here's the thing. They're hungry. Now they're hungry. Why? Because God says, I will supply all your needs. But the Israelites forgot about that because we quickly forget. Remember the Sabbath. And they said, okay, Moses, talk to your crazy friends there, the ones that I just delivered, and tell them that every day they must get out and I will provide food for them. He didn't provide for them spam anymore. He provided the holiest of holy manna. Quail, a dove came from everywhere to feed them. He says, all you have to do is go in, get what you need for that day, and the day of Sabbath get double. But that's it. Do not get no more. That was the command. That was the order. Pastor Nancy last week talked about condition to blessing. Yes, I heard it on the internet. You've got to have a condition for his blessing. You cannot expect a blessing without the condition. And so the condition was, God says, I will feed you, but you've got to follow what I told you. And the command was simple. Just get a pint size of food for you and the people in your tent. That's it. Double up on the day that you rest and we're good. But no. The slave mentality kicks in and says, wait, what if there isn't for tomorrow? What if there isn't for tomorrow? I have to take this job. I have to take the extra hours. I have to take the extra overtime because I may not have for tomorrow. But God is trying to tell you, it's not about overtime. It's about being faithful in the little and I will put you in the greater. God says, if you would just understand that I am your blessing. If you would just understand, he brings them the best food. And what did these, this, what did these Israelites do? They go and they got more. We got to get more just in case. And the Bible says that the food turned to maggots and they were spoiled. It spoiled on them. Watch, watch. Here's the, here's, here's the crazy thing. The food spoiled. The food spoiled because it was bad. The food spoiled because we were disobedient. Oh, y'all missed what I just said. You're trying to make ends meet. You think by doing more is better. You think if I can just work every day of the week. You think if I don't take any time to rest. And you're still trying to figure out why everything in your hands spoils. <laughs> it's because it's a commandment. God says, you were never meant to work seven days a week. You were meant to do six. And on the seventh, you're supposed to rest. Why? Because what happens is when we don't rest, then we get sick. Stay with me. Pastor, Pastor, but, 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 but I've heard, I've heard it said if you don't work, you don't eat. The statement is true, but if you don't rest, you don't work. How good are you to your workplace when you are sick with the flu, with a disease, with an illness, with a high blood pressure, with this or that? How good are you? Trust me, church, you're not as good as you think you are. So, Pastor, we shouldn't work. Oh, no, 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 you work. You work six days. And you keep the seven ones and you say, Lord, you made this holy. Therefore, I honor you with it. What does that mean? It means do nothing. Pastor, I can't even like stand up. Yeah, you can stand up. <laughs> Don't freak out because some of you are like, I don't even want to move. I'm trying to scare you. I'm trying to teach you something, church. The Bible says, he blessed it. He made it holy. Here's our mentality. Watch. If we're lazy, I'm talking to the lazy folk, you got no problem resting. You all work one day and rest six days. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, thank you Lord, talk to him, pastor, talk to him, talk to him. He's on his lazy boy waiting for a blessing to come. You need to get your lazy ass out of your lazy boy and do what you got to do and God will bless you. I know what I'm telling you. I know what I'm telling you. I know what I'm telling you. As is in the Bible, you can see. You work. The lazy spirit works when you should be resting. Like I just said, six days you rest and then you work on the one that you should be resting. Why do you do that? Because you're trying to catch up with what you should have done. So now a spirit and a door is open. A door of cheating. A door of greed. Well, maybe if I can just take a shortcut, I don't have to do it like the way they do it. I can do it in two days and be, oh, because I'm smart. No, you're not smart. You're sneaking. If you're sneaking, God's going like, to bring it to light. If I can just take a shortcut, if I can just do it this way, hey, nobody's going to see me. God is watching. The spirit of the lazy, the spirit of the workaholic. 
The spirit of the world says, I'm going to work six days and 23 hours. Well, you might as well work the seven days. That's what you don't understand. Pastor. I got to get ahead. I got to get the edge. I got to get the advantage. Now you've opened the door to greed and selfishness. Now you've opened the door to pride. And now you're telling God, God, I got this. I don't need you. I can control working the seven while you rest. God looks at you and says, really? I will pull the mat right under and make you understand that I am the blessing. You're not. It happened to my life. I know what I'm telling you. What spirit are you? Maybe you say, I'm neither. I'm good. I know how to rest. Great. Thank you. But the problem is, we're working. We're working when we should be resting. And then we're crying out to God, Lord, why am I so stressed? Why am I hurting? Why am I so tired? Why am I frustrated? Why am I worried about this and that? And God says, because you're trying to take control of a day that I gave you to rest. A day to renew. A day to refill. A day to refresh. How do you expect to function when you don't keep the day that I made holy? He blessed it. What does that mean? That means he doesn't expect me to work. That means that if I'm just obedient, he will bless that work that is not even being done on the seventh day. Somebody preach, man. Help me out. It's almost like, it's interesting how we know it with the car. I gotta keep going. It's almost like we know with the car. You, you, you see the thing and some cars change oil every 3,000 miles, some other 10, 15, depending on what you drive. But we're Hispanics. Ah, it's gonna, I, Pastor, it's driving really good. I think I can take it 30,000 miles without an oil change. So what do you do, Mexican? You just get yourself any pens oil that you find. Hey, you know, Dollar Tree, it's a dollar, it's good oil. You don't even read the weight that it's 1030, 1040, 2050. You don't care. It's synthetic, get you. So you open the thing and you put it in there and you keep putting oil because it keeps dripping and it keeps leaking. I should have told you something, Mexican, but it didn't tell you anything. Because you said, as long as it has oil, I should be okay. And you're moving and you're moving and you're moving. Oh, Lord Jesus, bless me. Really? It sounds funny, but that's how we live. So, so, so if you would have just spent $35 on an oil change, you would be running fine. But instead, you're living by faith. It's not faith, church. Don't even tell me what it is. And then it breaks down. And now you got a $5,000 problem because now the mechanic says, you got to change your engine. You broke every casket in there. Gasket in there. He says, he says, do you need to change the oil? Yeah, I put some every week. But did you change the filter? Oh. So now you have a $5,000 problem. Now you can't come to church and now you're blaming God for your problem when God said all you had to do was change it when it was supposed to change. Pastor, what does that have to do with me? Your body is the same way. Your body needs maintenance. Your body needs recovery. But no, let's keep going in Jesus' name because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Oh, I understand that. But I also understand that if God being the, great, the greatest person and the greatest God of the universe took a day to rest, why don't you think you need to chill? You need to relax. You need to renew. You need to refill. You need to refresh. Let him pour into your gas tank and stop complaining because you have diabetes and high blood pressure. And you're saying, God, heal me from stress. Heal me from this disorder, God, because I can't even heal you because you will listen to the commandment number four. I'm not saying that over again. We don't get it, church. We don't get it. All right. Commandment number three. Exodus 27. You shall not misuse, misuse the name of the Lord your God. That's what it says. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Basically, you should not use his name in vain. How many of you heard this commandment? We know it. We've heard it. What does it mean? Oh. Watch what you say. What does his name in vain mean? When we are degrading or insulting in any way to God's name, when we are joking about God in any way, when we show unbelief in God's ability, you didn't realize it, huh? Watch this. When we laugh at God, when we don't take God seriously, when we make a vow in God's name, but not really mean it or keep it. When we use God's name as a curse, blaspheming God or directing hatred at God, associating filth with God. All right, so let's break this down for a minute. Commandment number three, I shall not use his name in vain. 
Not V-E. Not the one in your arm. But vain. Do not use my name in vain. Well, I don't ever say God did. Okay, well that's great. You shouldn't because that's using his name in vain. Well, I don't really make fun of God. Okay, then you're on the right, right track. But now it goes a little bit deeper. If associating filth or if cur uh, using curse words has anything to do with it, I must go to Ephesians 4.29. Watch what Ephesians 4.29 says. It says, do not let any, any, somebody say any, any. unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to what? Their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth. Oh, Jesus, now we all failed. Pastor, that's what it's talking about, God's name in vain. But I, when I curse at people, I, I'm not saying God in there. No. But from the same mouth that you speak life and blessing, now you're speaking curse. If you call yourself a child of God, and if your body is the sanctuary, what is coming out of your sanctuary? For then, if I don't use the words God or other phrases that word means God, and you think you're fine, but yet every other word is a curse word that you sound like a sailor. Now we got a problem. Because from the same one that you speak life, the same one that God says, I need you to bless this, I need you to bless your food, I need you to bless your family, now you're turning around and using it every as a curse word. You're using my name in vain. No, God, I'm not using you. Yes, because you are mine. You belong to me. And everything that comes out of your mouth should be to edify, not to destroy. Wow. We got real quiet in the church. It got real quiet in here. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth. Pastor, but that's hard. Because I cuss at him because I'm trying to build him up. <laughs> I've never heard anybody be built up with words like stupid and idiot. I'm not even cursing yet. You tell me a phrase that actually is a curse word and it's used to edify? And I'll give you a high five. But I thought about it. I couldn't figure one out. I mean, you can't say, you're a stupid genius. You can't say that. I mean, it, it really, think about it, you, you can't say that. You can't use a negative with a positive. And when we speak, and so, when we're supposed to speak life, excuse me, and if we say that we have the power of life or death in the tongue, it doesn't say life and death, it says life and or death, meaning you can either have one or the other. Could it be, church? Could it be that the reason why when I try to speak positive, nothing really happens? Because my mind is full of filth and my heart is full of bitter and anger and curse words. So even when I try to mask it with a positive word, it's really not much. Could it be? Could it be? What does another scripture say? Colossians 3. Now watch what it says. Colossians 3. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things such as anger, rage. Y'all are not helping me preach here. You know? Yes. Help me preach. Things such as anger, malice, slander, and filthy from your yikes. Pastor, but every other word is an F word. Every other word is a yes word. Every other word is a because that's what she is. It sounds funny, but you cannot be calling your spouse that. You cannot be calling your friends that. You cannot be calling people that. You cannot be calling your family that and then expect to walk through these doors and raise your hand and lift his voice. God says, uh -uh, I turn my back on you. And he says, make amends with what you have and then come back to the altar. For you've been using my name in vain. Oh, we always thought it was just a God word, huh? No. It's not that easy, church. 
It's what we say, it's what we do. Pastor, but why? Because the one that curses has a reflecting spirit of anger in their heart. What are you saying? Because cursing takes the place of God to judge people. What do you mean? That means that we curse and we are condemning. When we curse someone, we condemn. When we curse someone, we judge. And God is the only one that has that authority. So every time you use these words, that they're just words. No. No. They're life or death. Try it. Change your mentality. Change your heart. Change your vocabulary. Try for a few weeks. Try for a few months. See what it does in your life. I'm telling you, it will change the way you speak, the way you see. It'll change the things around you. It'll bring life to where there's death. When we curse, we condemn. When we curse, it shows a lack of self-control. Therefore, we deny God's control. Oh, no. I love the Lord. I come to church. I give a 20 in the offering bucket. I raise my hands because I know every single song. The Lord lives in me and he has control over me. And then we're over You sound like a Hebrew. Oh yeah, you got control around. Right? God's got your life right on. He has the perfect control of your life. Question mark. Does he? Have you been using his name in vain more than you know? Can I go deeper? Look at what it says, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Sass. Oh, yes, Lord, I love you. I worship you. I, I serve you. I'll do anything. And we use his name. We use his name. And we use his name. And then God says, but I need you to do this. And I need you to be obedient. I, I, I don't got time for that. You're using his name in vain. <laughs> watch, watch. There's another one. Even deeper. I can go keep, I can keep doing this all day. Some of us are great. Oh, I want to pray. I got to pray tonight. I pray every night, Pastor. I pray every night. Right after you cuss the whole family out, I pray every night. <laughs> Pastor, it's because I, I do it because I, I, they need to change. We need to change. We need to change. Watch what it says in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Yikes. Pastor, I don't know about this sermon. I, I'm not really digging it. This wasn't a prosperity sermon and this wasn't a popularity sermon. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to be your pastor and tell you that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if you want to see a change in your life, you have to watch what we do, watch what we say. People are listening. People are watching. You may be the only Jesus people ever see. And when they find out that you're a leader of a church, a volunteer, or you sit in the third this, and you just, oh, I got a life behind a word because I have this. Look at the shirt that says, life behind. I love my pastor. Yeah, but every other word is an M up for Mutima Really? Please don't wear the shirt. Please. People are watching this church. People are watching this. Watch, I'm going to give you the same story I gave you a couple of weeks ago, but I, just so you can see it, and that's 19, 11, 16, and then out of your way. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Somebody say extraordinary. extraordinary. Miracles through Paul. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. I wish we could add our name to that list. God did extraordinary miracles through, enter your name. George, Rabina, Emily, Ray, Peter, John, whatever your name is. I wish we could say that. God did extraordinary miracles through Pepe. I wish we could say that. That's why we just don't see any miracles nowadays. It's because we don't see any more Pauls. Watch, watch, verse 12. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. A handkerchief. Why an apron? Because he was a tent maker. So he always had an apron. And so they said, if we can just get our hands on the apron, if we can just get our hands on the handkerchief, the same spirit that is in Paul is in his handkerchief. Bring it to the sick and they'll be healed. Wow. No, not anymore. Now we need a whole full-fledged revival. Lord, just Holy Spirit, come down for one minute. Let me bring Benny in, his brother, his sister, his cousin, his grandmother, and his ancestor, whatever. Bring them all. Let's fast for a hundred days. And, let, and we try to bring a miracle. We try to provide something that cannot be fabricated. But pastor, but Paul was a Christian killer. 
Yeah, he was. But when he saves you, there should be not only remorse, but also repentance. And when you repent, there's a 180 change. And when there's a 180 change, then the Holy Spirit can dwell in you. When the Holy Spirit can dwell in you, therefore now you have power in his name. Church, it's not what you've done. It's what we're doing. Please understand that he already died for what you've done. Now what are you going to do about what you're doing? Watch. So they didn't have chins, you touch, whatever, whatever, whatever. And evil spirits left in verse 13. Some Jews, some what? They weren't Gentiles, they weren't Pharisees, they weren't unbelievers. These were God's people. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Big mistake. Big mistake. In the name of Jesus sounds so good because we know there is power in the name of Jesus. But if there isn't any holiness in you, then there is no power in your mouth. Church, I'm trying to teach you something, church. If you really want to see change, we have to change. We have to change. I told the praise and worship this morning, what's the point in having a weapon if you have no ammunition? The Holy Spirit is the weapon. But what are you doing with the ammunition that God gave you? And it says, they did it in the name of Jesus. And they didn't say who we preach. They said whom Paul preaches. Because they knew Paul had power. Whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. For verse 14, the seven sons of Seba, a Jewish chief priest, were doing these preachers did seven of them seven of them along with the head chief priest this is not some just person on the back burner somebody on a bench warmer somebody that just ran into church. these are people who were leaders who were supposedly faithful who were supposedly God living and God fearing people who would follow his will but something happened they were trying to create a miracle that only Paul did and it goes on to say in verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them. Because <laughs> the devil talks back, church. <laughs> if you don't think he talks back, he talks back. Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who the heck are you? These were PKs, preacher's kids, the chief priest, and the demon goes, that doesn't scare me. Your title doesn't scare the devil, church. Your attendance to church doesn't scare the devil, church. How much you put in the offering bucket doesn't scare the devil, church. It's what you do with what you get from the word of God. The moment you apply it, the moment you put it into your life, demons start to shake. Demons start to... Wait, 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 wait. We know who this person is, and they've got great faith. They've learned to live in holiness. they learn to live in faithfulness. When they speak, something happens. Please don't say the name of Jesus, because when you say the name of Jesus with authority and power, the devil has to flee. Wow. Wow. And the evil spirit answered these chunks and said, I know you and I know Paul. And who are you? Watch what it says in verse 16. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Oh, the devil doesn't have power. Oh, the devil has power. Stop using his name in vain. Stop asking like you're some holy roller and trying to get a group preacher and trying to get these private little Bible studies. Oh, in Jesus' name. If there's no unity, if there's no honesty, if there's no loyalty or integrity, you can say all the name what that you want, but all you're doing is invoking the spirit of the devil in your life. And then he's going to come upon you, leave you naked and bleeding and wonder what the heck is going on here. When you don't do things the way God says, things don't work out. Ah, oh, come on, church. Pastor, what are you saying? Number one, the first thing we need to learn, we need to learn to rest. It's a commandment. Exodus 33, 14. The Lord replied. Watch what it says. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. When I do what I'm supposed to do, church, when I do what I'm supposed to do, church, I don't have to ask for a miracle. You missed the verse. 
the verse that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul that even the handkerchiefs and aprons were used. Paul didn't say, oh Lord, let these aprons and handkerchiefs work. Oh Lord, I put I spit on them. Do whatever I have to do. Let me put my body order. Maybe they'll be No. Because when you have the Spirit upon you, you don't have to ask for miracles. You don't have to ask for demons to leave. You don't have to ask for peace in your house. Spirit is already there. The Spirit is within you. So you carry it from place to place. You can have peace at home. You can have peace in your marriage. You can have peace in your finances. You can find rest in Him. But He said, come to me, all those who are weary and are tired, and I will give you rest. You can't find rest in a pill. You can't find rest in money. You can't find rest in working of overtime. But the moment you bow down, Raise your hands and come through those doors and understand that I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you come through me, my presence will go with you in the Lord of Kings. Watch Psalms 103. Stay standing. Stay standing. Psalms 103.1. So, Pastor, I shouldn't be cursing. No, you shouldn't be cursing. You should praise the Lord with all my soul and all my inmost being. It says, praise His holy name. Your mouth should speak praises. Your mouth should speak life. Your mouth, your mouth should speak blessing. Your mouth should be building people up, not tearing people down. Why don't things change? Maybe you got to change your oil filter in your mouth. Remember to keep the Sabbath day, Sabbath day holy, for it is blessed. More isn't always better. Obedience is key. I've been more blessed when I have no job. <laughs> and when I do, I don't have permission anymore because time has run out. <laughs> if there's anybody here that does not have Jesus in their heart, you say, Pastor, I, I haven't been living the way you've been this saying I should live. I'm just ready to change, Lord. I just, I don't feel it, Lord. I, I, I want a new start, Lord. I, I want to know about this. Jesus, raise your hand high. We're going to ask you to raise your hand high. We're going to ask you to come up. Can you come up? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. We're not going to ask you to sing. Don't worry. We're not here to embarrass you. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. We just want to pray with you. That's all. That's all. Let's give them a time. Let, let, let's give the Lord a praise offering. This is a celebration time. Is anybody else here? Maybe you're coming here as a couple. Thank you for being honest. Maybe you're coming here as a couple and your marriage is not where it needs to be. And you say, Lord, I, I need to start all over. Is there any more salvations before we do that? And anybody else that needs to be saved? Come on up because I'm going to say a prayer with you. They're going to pray with you right now. They're going to pray with you right now. Wow. Salvation. I bless you, man. Bless you, my blessing. Come together, come together. Listen, yes, God is good. God is good, Melissa. I told you. I told you, Melissa. I don't have permission to share what just happened here, but let me just tell you, God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Oh God, I feel his presence in this place. God is faithful. Ooh. Wow. Oh. All right, if there's anybody else that just needs a touch from the Lord, you say, Pastor, I need to renew my mind, renew my heart. I need to change my mind, my vocabulary, my heart. Come on up quickly, quickly, quickly. Just raise your hands as you come in. Just raise your hands as you come in. 
First things first, ask the Lord for forgiveness.